have these great ideas and you're going to find you're going to run up against the social environment. If you'll indulge me, I want to skip forward. Um, you're going to run up against the social environment and you're going to run up against what I call the mousetrap myth. Some of you have already felt this mousetrap myth. I already asked you about it. The mousetrap myth is this belief that when we have great ideas, we're just readily accepted. If you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Who said that? We don't actually know. We, there's two or three people who are attributed to us saying it. None of them actually said it. And I think there's a good reason for that. They would know that it's total rubbish. If you, beat a path, if you build a, a better mousetrap, the world will not beat a path to your door. In fact, they might actually try and beat you down. Best case scenario, they just ignore you. Right? And we know this time and time again. Kodak invented the digital camera. Do you know that? Kodak invented the digital camera. They said, ah, why would anyone want this? It's no better than film. Well, forget it. Xerox invented the personal computer. Right? The, but they basically it was presented to the higher ups and they said, this has nothing to do with photocopies. We're not going to bother with this. And what actually happened, this is a fun side note in business history, what actually happened was Steve Jobs went and toured Xerox's research facility, saw it, and stole it. Right? He basically, he hired some people from Xerox, and then he hired a couple of people who said, I've seen the future, we're working on this project, we're working on what was called a graphical user interface, right? And Xerox came up with the first one, it allowed personal computing to kind of happen, right? And then Jobs accused Microsoft of stealing it from them, which I always thought was interesting. And one time he even confronted Gates and said, you stole from us, you ripped us off, you should be ashamed. And Gates, in very Bill Gates fashion, he goes, I don't look at it that way, Steve. What do you mean? I Look at it like I broke into our neighbor Xerox's house and found you had already taken the TV. <laughs> it's brilliant. I mean, no response. No response necessary. But what happened? Why didn't Xerox see it, right? We see this time and time again. It's not just in business, right? The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky is an amazingly groundbreaking piece in the history of ballet and musical composition. Did you know it started not one but two riots on its opening night? It was so different from the music of the time that there were people that loved it and heralded it, and there were people that hated it on initial hearing. And those people were in the same theater at the same time. They began to argue. And the argues turned into pushing and shoving. The pushing and shoving turned into fist fights. Fist fights turned into an all-out riot. Police broke up the riot, and this is the, probably the darkest moment in the whole story, then decided, on with the show. <laughs> And the same thing happened again. So not one, but two riots in the same night. Stravinsky, Stravinsky fled the theater, never got to see the curtain close on his opening night. And now, Rite of Spring is a pivotal piece in the history of ballet and musical composition. And now, if you've ever seen, how many of you have ever seen Fantasia? So you've heard the Rite of Spring. Now we show it to our four-year-olds and they don't hit any, well, they don't hit anyone because of the Rite of Spring. <laughs> So what's going on here? Well, for an idea to be an innovation, for it to be creative, it has to do two things. It has to be new and it has to be useful. Right? New and useful. If you ask a bunch of people for a definition of creativity, you'll get synonyms around these words. Original and valuable, or novel and practical. What, new and useful. But as humans, we are terrible at reconciling these two things. Because if it's new, what are we asking it to do? We're asking it to depart from the status quo, to be something different. We're asking you to trust us. We're doing away with paper, right? We're asking it to depart from our past experiences. But in order to judge whether or not it's useful, what do we have to rely on? Those same past experiences. So we're asking something simultaneously to depart from the status quo, but we're judging it based on what we already know status quo-wise. And this is really tricky, and we're really bad at it. And it turns out in periods of uncertainty, we're even worse at it. We will say that we love creative ideas, but when we're presented a series of them, we'll select, we'll always default to the ones that make us comfortable, to the ones that are more like the status quo. Why does this matter? For two reasons. The first is that as you're engaging on whatever project you want to start, you got motivated from today and excited and you want to steal this idea like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and you want to bring it to your department, you want to do something great, I'm sorry, but you're going to face some resistance but that's okay. You're in good company. You're in company with Jobs. You're in company with Xerox. You're in company with Kodak. You're in company with Stravinsky. And you're facing a natural resistance. It's okay, and plan for it. Mm -hmm.